Please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Walsh, and uh, as president and CEO of Wilson Franklin University, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our campus this evening. We are honored by the number of leaders from the community who have joined us tonight and thank the Gorta Family Foundation, North Chicago Community Partners, Advance Illinois, Wind Trust Financial, and Trinity International University for organizing this event. Together, we are fostering dialogue on the important topic of education as it impacts our region and our nation. In our 100-year history as a health sciences graduate level academic institution, Rosalind Franklin University has demonstrated commitment to a model of education that requires students to work side by side, learning with, from, and about each other regardless of their professional role, believing this to be essential to 21st century collaborative healthcare delivery in the United States. But this is not the only area in which we feel collaboration is key. We need to work together as a city, a county, a state, and a region to impact the future of education itself. Presciently, as it turns out, I began my 2010 University Convocation speech from this podium with the following quotations extracted from a New York Times editorial. <laughs> As the greatest nation slips away, we need to be the regeneration, a generation that renews, refreshes, re-energizes, and rebuilds America for the 21st century. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the podium David Gorta from the Gorta Family Foundation, who will introduce the author of those Churchillian sentiments. Thank you, David. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, welcome, and thanks for coming. Before I introduce our featured speaker, I wanted to extend a few thank yous. This four-part speaker series on the topic of education would not be possible were it not for the help of a few friends who are as, feel as committed to the topic as we do. First and foremost, I want to thank Robin Staines and the Advanced Illinois team for all their assistance in this project. When we first proposed the concept of a speaker series many months ago, I asked if Advanced Illinois would like to be a partner. They immediately said yes. As one of the most influential thought leaders in the state on education reform, their buy-in was extremely encouraging. I urge you to learn more about Advance Illinois and the remarkable work they are doing. Second, I want to thank our host tonight, Michael Welch, and the team here at Roslyn and Franklin. What a fantastic facility this is. Who knew such a, a resource was in our midst? If you were like me, you have been driven by this university countless times wondering <coughs> what exactly is going on in there. A few months ago, I came to the tour of the school and was absolutely blown away by what they are doing. I urge you to do the same. I know they would love to show you around. Third, to the men and women of Trinity International University who talk the talk and more importantly, walk the walk. For years now, students from Trinity have been putting service learning into action by helping countless children in the North Chicago area by volunteering in area schools. They, along with many others, are acting as the foot soldiers in the battle to provide all with an equal opportunity to a good education. This is not easy work, yet it is so important. Thank you for leading by example. Fourth, to Ed Raymer and the folks at Wintrust Financial, who so graciously are helping to underwrite this series. Wintrust is providing valuable banking services in this geographic area because, as we all know, part of breaking the vicious cycle of poverty and poor education is to build a healthy, vibrant business community. Step one is offering businesses the capital to start and or grow. By being involved in this community, they are making a difference. Finally, I would be remiss to not thank Gay Mitchell. For the last month, Gay has been tasked with keeping everything with uh, respect to this evening in check. It has not been easy. 
I liken it to herding cats. Three other things to note. You were offered an index card when you checked in tonight so you could write down any questions you might have for Tom. We will have people coming through the auditorium to collect those cards and Tom will answer as many as possible. Robin Staines will be acting as a moderator. Our guest speaker will be signing his latest book after tonight's program for about 45 minutes. The signing will take place down the hall to the left as you exit the auditorium. There will be two lines, one for books purchased and another one for previously purchased books. Please be patient and understanding because of time constraints and the number of people attending this event, there will be no personalized inscriptions. Finally, please silence your cell phones and pagers. Now to our program. There are many problems facing this country these days, perhaps no more important than the education conundrum. To say that the country is in an educational crisis and at a critical crossroad is an understatement. The inability of the United States to impact basic critical thinking strategies and practical knowledge that translates into meaningful real world skills to all of its citizenry is the root cause of many of the society's ills. And while it would be nice if there was a single answer to what ails us, that is simply wishful thinking. The problems are vast and complex, and the final solution will not so much resemble a single hue, but rather take on the form of a patchwork quilt. It will be an amalgam of many ideas and approaches that will eventually solve the problem. It will also require all of us, the collective, to play our part in helping solve this problem whether it is getting involved with the likes of Advanced Illinois to help shape policy and move legislation, or getting involved at the local level by joining the school board or PTA, or volunteering and getting involved with a not-for-profit like North Chicago Community Partners, you need to get engaged and be part of the solution. We hope that this series we have organized, which starts by looking at education from a macro view and ends up focusing on a local community and educational transformation will help provide context and act as a catalyst for change locally. Now it is time to introduce tonight's elect featured speaker. Judging by the size of tonight's audience, he apparently does not need much of an introduction. Rather than rereading what was already in your program, I will instead give you three fun facts about him that one would not necessarily find in his formal CV. First, Education is a topic that runs deep in the household, as his wife, Anne, is the chair of the Seed Foundation in Washington, D.C. Seed schools are high-performing college public boarding schools that serve students from traditionally underserved communities. Second, he is a sportsman of some note. He is a rather passionate golfer who, given the chance, hits the links whenever his busy schedule allows Based on what we learned today, he's not going to be playing much golf. You can learn a lot about somebody on the golf course. I wonder how many of his interviews have been conducted while playing an innocent round. Finally, he is a good sport and has a wonderful sense of humor. He was recently on Celebrity Jeopardy, facing off against the likes of Anderson Cooper and Kelly O'Donnell. After a slow start, he found his groove and came on strong, finishing second and winning a nice chunk of change for his charity. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming out. It's a treat for me to be here today uh, to, to donate a lecture for uh, my dear friends, the Gordy family, uh, Jim and Audrey and uh, uh, David and Mary. Uh, they're, they're such good citizens, and I know such uh, contributors to your community. It's really my honor to be here this evening. Um, I am going to talk about my latest book, That Used to Be Us, and really how it relates to education. But David did allude to something. I, I usually, you know, I, I, I used to get a little nervous before I s spoke you know, publicly, but once you've been on Jeopardy, I have to tell you. <laughs> That is the scariest thing in the whole world. I mean, just the chance for a YouTube moment is so high. 
After that, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> so that used to be us, how America lost its way in the world it invented and how we can come back. Whenever uh, myself and my co-author, Michael Mandelbaum, uh, tell people about our book, their first question usually is, but, but does it have a happy ending? And we tell people it does. We just don't know whether it's fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> We're still trying to figure that out. Now, you might wonder, how did two guys, two foreign policy geeks, I'm the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, Michael is the chaired professor of international relations, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. How did two foreign policy geeks end up writing a book about America? Uh, the answer is very simple. We're close friends. We've been friends for 20 years. We're actually neighbors in Bethesda, Maryland. We start many days uh, speaking on the phone with each other. And we started to notice something um, over recent years. We would start every day talking about the world, as we always did. But we'd end every day talking about America. And it became apparent to us that it was really America, its fate, future, vigor, and vitality, that really was the biggest foreign policy issue in the world. Because Michael and I, we're, we're sort of old-style American nationalists. We believe the United States, we, we do a lot of, you know, we make our share of mistakes in the world. But we believe, on balance, the United States is a hugely constructive force in the world, that we provide an enormous number of global public goods, whether it's preserving the trade and sea lanes in the Pacific or promoting the United Nations or World Trade Organization, any number of things. And we really are of the view that if America goes dark, if America goes weak, if we can't play that role in the world, your kids won't just grow up in a different America. They will grow up in a fundamentally different world, ordered by China or Russia, or maybe nobody at all. So something very big is at stake right now in our ability or inability to pass on the American dream to another generation so it can play that constructive role in the world. Now, Michael and I are both movie buffs, and the uh, book is built, actually, around a lot of movie themes. And there is one movie that we point to a particular scene that somehow, to some degree, really sums up the concern we have about America today. It's that 1958 Orson Welles classic, Touch of Evil. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen it. A movie about murder and kidnapping, conspiracy and corruption in a town on the Mexican-American border. Orson Welles plays a crooked cop who tries to frame his Mexican counterpart for a murder. At one point, Wells stumbles into a brothel and finds the proprietor, Marlene Dietrich, who is also a fortune teller with cards spread out in front of her. Read my future for me, Wells says. You haven't got any, she replies. Your future is all used up. Is that us? Is that America? Is our future all used up? But well, we don't think so. We don't think so at all. But we also think we can't just assume that by default, we're going to be able to pass on the American dream to another generation. We need to get our act together. We need to get focused. We need to be, as Michael said, the regeneration. So let me indulge you, if I can, for a minute, by just reading you the first few paragraphs of the book. It's the opening chapter, just to give you a sense of where I'm going here. And the opening chapter of the book is called, If You See Something, Say Something. This is a book about America that begins in China. In September 2010, I attended the World Economic Forum's summer conference in Tianjin, China. Five years earlier, getting to Tianjin had involved a three and a half hour car ride from Beijing to a polluted, crowded Chinese version of Detroit, but things had changed. Now to get to Tianjin, you head to the Beijing South Railway Station, an ultra-modern flying saucer of a building with glass walls and an oval roof covered with 3,246 solar panels. 
You buy a ticket from an electronic kiosk offering choices in Chinese and English and board a world-class high-speed train that goes right to another roomy modern train station in downtown Tianjin. Said to be the fastest in the world when it began operating in 2008, the Chinese bullet train covers 72 miles in 29 minutes. The conference itself took place in the Beijing Tianjin Convention and Exhibition Center, a massive, beautifully appointed structure, the like of which exists in few American cities. As if the convention center wasn't impressive enough, the conference's co-sponsors gave some facts and figures. They noted that the building contained a total floor area of 2.5 million square feet, and that construction of the Beijing Tianjin Convention Center started on September 15th, 2009, and was completed in May 2010. Reading that line, I started walking around my room, counting on my fingers, September, October, November, December. That's eight and a half months. Returning home to Maryland from that trip, I was describing the Tianjin complex and how quickly it was built to my co-author, Michael, and his wife, Anne. At one point, Anne interrupted and said, excuse me, Tom, have you been to our subway stop lately? Now, we all live in Bethesda, Maryland, and we often use the Washington Metro or subway to get to work in downtown Washington, DC. I had just been at the Bethesda station, and I knew exactly what Anne was talking about. The two short escalators had been under repair for six months. While the one being fixed was closed, the other had to be shut off and converted into a two-way staircase. At rush hour, this was creating a huge mess. Everyone trying to get on and off the platform had to squeeze single file up and down one frozen escalator. It sometimes took 10 minutes to get out of the station. A sign on the closed escalator said its repairs were part of a massive escalator modernization project. What was taking the modernization project so long? We investigated. Kathy Asado, a spokeswoman for Washington Metro, said that the repairs were scheduled to take about six months and are on schedule. Mechanics need 10 to 12 weeks to fix each escalator. A simple comparison made a startling point. It took China's Teta Construction Group 32 weeks to build a world-class convention center from the ground up, including giant escalators in every corner, and it was taking Washington Metro 24 weeks to repair two tiny escalators of 21 steps each. We searched a little further and found that on November 14, 2010, the Washington Post ran a letter to the editor from one Mark Thompson of Kensington, Maryland, who wrote, as someone who has ridden Metro for more than 30 years, I can think of an easier way to assess the health of the escalators. For decades, they ran silently and efficiently, but over the past several years, when the escalators are running, aging or ill-fitting parts have generated horrific noises that sound to me like a Tyrannosaurus Rex trapped in a tar pit, screeching its dying screams. <laughs> Quote we found most disturbing, though, came from Maryland Community News story about the long lines at rush hour caused by the seemingly endless metro repairs. It was from Benjamin Ross, who lives in Bethesda, and commutes every day to downtown. And Ross said, my impression, standing on line, is that people have sort of gotten used to it. People have sort of gotten used to it. Indeed, that sense of resignation, that sense that, well, this is just how things are in America today, that sense that America's best days are behind it and China's best days are ahead of it, have become the subject of water cooler, dinner party, grocery line, and classroom conversations all across our country. So do we buy the idea, increasingly popular in some circles, that Britain owned the 19th century, America dominated the 20th century, and China will inevitably reign supreme in the 21st century? No. No, we do not. And we've written this book to explain why no American, young or old, should resign himself or herself to that view either. The two of us are not pessimists when it comes to America and its future. We are optimists, but we are also frustrated we are two frustrated optimists. The title of this chapter is, If You See Something, Say Something. You know where that's from. That is the motto of the Department of Homeland Security. It plays over and over on loudspeakers in airports and railway stations around our country today. Well, we have seen and heard something, and millions of Americans have too. What we've seen is not a suspicious package left under a stairwell. What we've seen is hiding in plain sight. We've seen something that poses a greater threat to our national security and well-being than anything Al-Qaeda does. 
We've seen a country with enormous potential failing, falling into the worst sort of decline, a slow decline. Just slow enough for us not to drop everything and pull together, and pull together to fix what needs fixing. This book is our way of saying something about what is wrong, why things have gone wrong, and what we can and must do to make them right. So that's how the book begins. Now the essential argument of this book is that America today faces four great challenges. I'm gonna just talk about the first two, but I'll go through them quickly. The first is how we look at the world. The second is how we adapt to the biggest thing happening in the planet today, the merger of globalization and the IT revolution. I'm gonna talk about those in detail. The third is how we deal with debt and deficit, all these issues of entitlements, Medicare, Social Security, that you're so familiar with. And last is energy and climate, how we power the future of our middle class and middle classes around the planet without tipping our Earth into climate change and disruption. Let's focus on the first two, which are really, I think, the guts of the challenge you're facing here in, uh, in North Chicago in how we really respond to what is the biggest thing happening in the world today. But as I said, the first problem we face is really a perceptual problem. You know, if, if you don't start as a business, as a community, or as a country, by starting every day by asking, what world are we living in? What world are we living in, and what are the biggest trends in this world, and how do we orient ourselves as a company, or a community, or a country to those trends? you're going to get yourself in trouble. We as a country today, that is not how we start our day. We started today, in fact, just today. We started today with a debate over whether Barack Obama was even born in this country. Can you think of anything more stupid than that? Okay. That's how we started today. I turned it on. I saw it on the morning news. Now, our Air Force, the US Air Force has a concept. They teach in fighter pilot school. It's called the OODA loop. It stands for O-O-D-A. Observe, orient, decide, act. And what we teach our fighter pilots is that if you're in a dogfight up there in the sky and your ability as a fighter pilot to observe, orient, decide, and act is faster than the other fighter pilot, you will shoot them out of the sky. But if their ability to observe, orient, decide, and act is faster than you, they will shoot you out of the sky. Right now, our national OODA loop, our ability to observe, orient, decide, and act on the biggest trends in the world today is deeply discombobulated. Well, what would we be looking at? What would we be observing, orient ourselves toward, deciding and acting on if we were paying attention? We'd be looking at the biggest thing happening on the planet today, something that's been disguised by the subprime crisis, the Great Recession, and post 9-11. And that is the merger of globalization and the IT, the information technology revolution, which is changing everything. What's happened under the disguise of 9-11 and the Great Recession is that the world has gone, we argue in the book, from connected to hyper-connected. And it is changing everything from the workplace to education to society and how we interact. Now, I know a little bit about this subject because back in 2004, I started working on a book called The World is Flat, came out in 2005, that was about the world getting connected. Just connected, let alone hyper-connected. So when I sat down to write this book, one of the first things I did was get the original first edition of The World is Flat, which I started in 2004, off the bookshelf. I cracked it open to the index, looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, 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 A. Facebook wasn't in it. So when I was out there writing, the world is flat. We're all connected. Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place, LinkedIn was a prison, applications were what you sent to college, and for most people, Skype was a typo. Okay. 
I love doing that. Can I do that again? Okay. <laughs> All of that happened after I wrote The World is Flat. And that's what I mean when I say the world's gone from connected to hyper-connected. And what's new about this hyper-connectivity is not only the speed, not only you know, the number of people involved. What's new, and you have to pay attention to this, are the simple interfaces. So now an illiterate farmer in India can just pick up a web-enabled phone and say, when do I plant my crops? How much water do I put on my fields today? And it pushes him an answer. So when I wrote The World is Flat, I said we'd connected uh, Boston and Bangalore in India. We've now connected Boston, Bangalore, and Sirisi. Say, where's Sirisi? Sirisi is a town 90 miles to the interior with 90,000 people, which thanks to web-enabled cell phones, browsers, flip cams, videos, all these things, they're on the web now in Sirisi, not just Bangalore, with your kids in mind. When I wrote The World is Flat, I said we've connected Detroit and Damascus. We've now connected Detroit, Damascus, and Dara. You say, where's Dara? Dar is the dusty Syrian border town on the Syrian-Jordanian border where the Syrian revolution began, which thanks to these cell phones, flip cams, YouTube, we've been able to watch a lot of the Syrian revolution despite the fact that the Syrian government has banned every international media organization in the world, including Al Jazeera. We've watched it because if you just go to YouTube, you'll find there a virtual network called SNN, Sham News Network, Sham is Arabic for Syria, where the Syrian rebel, rebels basically dump all their video. And we can watch it there every day. That's how we cover the Syrian revolution. The dozen people here in the front row have in their wallets right now enough money to have started Sham News Network. That's a world that's gone from connected to hyper-connected. Now, when I travel, I love to collect these kind of stories. I always like to read the local papers. I was, I was in India in October 2010, and I came across this article in the Hindustan Times. It said that a Nepali telecommunications firm had just started providing 3G mobile network service at the summit of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. The story said this would, quote, allow thousands of climbers and trekkers who throng the region every year access to high-speed internet and video calls using their mobile phones. Can you imagine how many phone calls are now being made from the top of Mount Everest that begin, Mom, you'll never guess where I'm calling you from. <laughs> that's a world that's gone from connected to hyper-connected. But we see this in a lot of other ways, in the education sphere. I'm from Minnesota, my wife is from Iowa. My mother-in-law went to Grinnell College, she's here tonight, she just got an honorary doctorate from Grinnell. God bless her. <laughs> Last year, Grinnell College, 1,600 students, gem of a little school in central Iowa, 9% of all applications came from China. Of that 9%, 43% had perfect 800s on their math SATs. Now, I'm not talking about USC. I'm not talking about Stanford. I'm talking about Grinnell College in central Iowa. 255 applications from China, 43% with perfect 800s on their math SATs. If you think you're competing with the kid down the street for a place in Grinnell, get that out of your head. You're competing with students at Shanghai PS21. And I remember I was an undergrad at Brandeis. I mean, I think we had one Chinese exchange student, Zhao, who taught us all to eat with chopsticks or whatever. Oh, forget that. OK. That is like so round world. Not in a hyper-connected world anymore. So what does all this hyper-connectivity mean for education in the workplace? Well, what it means in simple terms is if the world were a single math class, 
the whole global curve just rose. The whole global curve just rose. Because every college president, every boss today, now has access to more cheap automation, cheap robotics, cheap software, cheap labor, and cheap genius than ever before. So the whole global curve has risen. And that leads to me to the central socioeconomic fact of our time. We devote a full chapter to it in the book. And that is that average is over. Average is officially over. If all you do is an average job, you will not earn an average wage to sustain an average lifestyle today. Everyone has to identify, nurture, and produce something extra, some unique value add that justifies why they should be hired and why they should be promoted. We all have to find our extra. And we're going to talk a lot more about that tonight. It's why I tell my girls, girls, when I'm an old fuddy-duddy, uh, when I went to college, I got to find a job. You will have to invent a job. That's the big difference between us and our kids. It may not be your first job. If you're lucky, it won't be your first job. But to keep and advance in that job, you will have to invent, reinvent, and re-engineer that job. I was down in Dallas working on the book and sat next to a banker at a dinner, a very big banker, and he said to me something really stuck in my head. He said, Tom, today you only hire someone if you absolutely have to. And the job for all of us as educators, as potential employers, is to make it so they absolutely have to hire you. That's the biggest impact of the hyper-connected world. Old saying in Texas, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you ever got, that is no longer applicable. If all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is not all you ever got. You will get less now. Not when you're competing with cheap labor, cheap genius, software, robotics, and automation. It just can't be anymore. Woody Allen's dictum, 90% of life is just showing up no longer applicable. If you just show up now, you will not earn an average wage or an average lifestyle. OK, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking very easy for you to say, Mr. Smarty Pants, New York Times columnist. Now, let me tell you about my job. So I became the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times in January 1995. I inherited James Reston's office at the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. What an honor. I inherited the office of this great columnist and editor of the time in the 60s and 70s. What a thrill. Got to meet him several times. Now, I suspect Mr. Reston used to come to the office back in the 60s and 70s and say to himself every morning, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. And he knew all seven personally, Walter Lippmann, Mary McGrory, Stuart Alsop, Tony Lewis. I do the same thing. I come to the office every morning and I say, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write today. <laughs> I have 70 million competitors. You want to read what I wrote about India you know, a couple weeks ago? Well, just read that and then go to Real Clear Politics and compare what Indian columnists are writing about the same subject. I was in India in September. I went out to IIT Jodhpur. It's one of their MITs India is famous for. IIT Jodhpur was brand new, one of their new technology colleges, and they were famous because they had, the president there invited me out because they had just invented a $39 iPad. Now it's a stripped down version for education, nowhere near the beauty and functionality of the Apple iPad, but it worked. I even brought one home. Two electrical engineering professors there had designed and produced the product at IIT Jodhpur for the Ministry of Education in India. And best part of the story I always love, they're both electrical engineering professors, and one of them comes from a village in India with no electricity. <laughs> okay. Now, what you're going to see in the hyper-connected world is this radical breaking of price points, where something goes from $400 to $39.95. Now, don't get me wrong again. This is not the iPad. But it's a pretty good stripped-down version, or at least seemed to be. So I thought, I think I'll write a column about this. 
I wrote a Sunday column about this. Thought it was very interesting. Showed how it was made and whatnot. My Sunday column moves at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on, on Saturday night. Sometime between 8 p.m. Saturday night and 8 a.m. Sunday morning, when you here in Chicago may have read it, someone in India posted a lab stress test of the device in the comments section under my column. Okay. Now, if you think that doesn't keep me on my toes, I, I, imagine, I mean, you write about this device, and before your readers have had a chance to read about it, someone in India has gone into the comment section and posted a lab stress test of the device. Fortunately, it backed up the column, but maybe next time it wouldn't. So we're all kind of under this same pressure. Average is over. So what does it mean then for the labor market? Let's look at that, and then let's ask what it means for education. Historically, the labor market has been divided in three rough tiers. The top tier, the one you want to be in, is called non-routine work. And non-routine work is work that requires critical thinking and problem solving. We all want to be non-routine workers. Engineers, scientists, ballet dancers, writers, authors, chemists, doctors, lawyers, accountants. All these people who do work that cannot be described by an algorithm and therefore outsourced, automated, or digitized. Second category is routine work, whether there's routine service work, working in the back room of a bank or an insurance company, or working on a factory line, work that could be routine and therefore described by an algorithm and roboticized or automated. That work has been crushed basically by the hyper-connected world. And that work sustained a lot of the American middle class. You know what they say about the modern American factory today? It just has two employees, a man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the man away from the machines. Okay? <laughs> that is, though, what is happening to routine work. Now, at the, at the other end, I don't want to say the bottom end, because this can be very lucrative work, is non-routine local work. That's the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Work that has to be done face to face in a specific location. A nurse, a dentist, your divorce lawyer. This has got to be done face to face in a specific location. And the wages of your non-routine local workers will depend on the concentration of non-routine high-skilled workers you have. In other words, it's much better to be a dentist in Cupertino, California, a next to Facebook and Apple, uh, than it would be you know, in some remote hamlet in Mississippi. So those are the three kind of tiers of the labor market. But as I say, the middle one is being crushed. But here's what's happening under the pressure of the hyper-connected world. It's not enough anymore to say, I'm non-routine. I'm non-routine, I'm safe. I'm a, I'm a college professor. I teach, uh, I teach biology. Uh, here at this fine school. I'm safe. Well, not really, because uh, Stanford and um, uh, Princeton and um, uh, Michigan and Berkeley have just formed a consortium where um, Stanford professors will very happily uh, teach your biology course from Stanford and even provide a format for your students to be tested, graded, and get a certificate that they have completed the course for $50. Now, you've got to be creative non-routine now. You've got to bring something extra. Because why do we need your biology class? We can get the best in the world now, here or at your community college or any other school. It's not enough to be a, you know, a lawyer. You've got to be a creative lawyer. Not enough to be a columnist. I've got to be a creative columnist now. Not enough to say I'm an accountant. You've got to be a creative accountant. Well, not a creative accountant, but you know what I mean. A, <laughs> some of these you want to be careful about. So, but the point is, everybody has got to identify, nurture, and advance their extra. That's really uh, the challenge that we all face right now. Now, the way we learned about this, I'm, I'm not a, never got an education degree. I, everything I do is, is through reporting. So what we did, really, to, before we could really address education in the book, what we did was simply go out and ask employers. So everything I'm telling you now, 
I didn't learn from any book, any professor. I learned from going and talking to employers and simply asking them, what are you looking for today? So in the book, in our chapter called Help Wanted, we interviewed four generic employers. The head of a uh, Washington, a high-end white collar, the head of a, the national office of a national law firm, Nixon Peabody, the head of their Washington office. Uh, we interviewed low and white collar, the head of the 24-7 outsourcing firm, actually where I started, the world is flat. Uh, blue collar, we interviewed Ellen Coleman, the head of DuPont. And green collar, we interviewed the head of the world's biggest green collar firm, the United States Army. And here's what's really interesting. They're all four looking for the same employee. And what is that employee? Who is that employee? They're all looking for people who can do critical thinking and problem solving, dot, 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 in order to get an interview. Critical thinking and problem solving is table stakes now. What they're really looking for are people who can not only do critical thinking and problem solving, but invent, reinvent, and re-engineer their job while they're doing it. Why is that? Because when the pace of change in a hyper-connected world gets this fast, okay, the big boss up there cannot possibly know what's going on down on the factory line or where the manufacturing or the service really meets the customer. They have to have employees who are, as Ellen Coleman, the head of DuPont said, who are present all the time, paying attention, thinking about what they're doing, 